Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here, triathletics.com. Uh, today we're gonna talk about tips to get out of the Superdome. So let's first describe uh, what exactly is the Superdome. Uh, so we've all been there. Uh, this is when a pitcher is having uh, consistency, command issues, um, but we suspect a strong mental component here. So a lot of times this can be linked to uh, confidence issues, uh, lacking confidence. Uh, we can refer to these guys as being yipped up, uh, though obviously we don't like to use that word. Um, so there tends to be a strong mental component and we've all seen the guys who are just really searching. They, they're kind of grasping at straws. Um, and so most of us have been there at some point. Uh, but the key thing here to, to recognize before we get into some of these tips for how to get out of it is realizing that not all command issues can just be simply distilled into uh, a mental cause. So every issue ultimately will become a mental cause. So let's say there's a mechanical origin to to this issue or an injury origin to this issue, a physical limitation that's causing this inconsistency, uh, eventually that lack of performance will become a mental issue. But we need to be able to separate that and say like, it's not always solely uh, someone being kind of a, a mental midget, as a lot of coaches like to say. Sometimes there's uh, an interaction with other different variables. And so we'll get into that as well. Uh, we've all been there. So just understanding like it doesn't mean one guy, one guy is necessarily mentally weaker than another. Um, there's a lot of complex interactions that go into uh, this consistency and, and command and uh, being able to actually perform under pressure. Uh, and then finally, uh, for, for those of you who are specifically looking into like tips for command, although this video does cover some of them, uh, I'll go ahead and link a couple of different videos in the description where we've uh, talked about this at length in, in other uh, perspectives as well. So my first tip here is to establish the cause. So as a coach, when we have an athlete who comes to us and is really struggling with kind of the mental component, struggling with their command consistency, we wanna understand the history. So how did these issues actually start? How did they arise? Was it immediately after an injury? Was it immediately after they had some sort of coaching cue or intervention from maybe their school coach or their summer ball coach or their coach with their professional organization? Did they try to change their arm path did they try to change their, their lead leg? Did they introduce uh, some sort of cue uh, that seemed to just uh, be the origin of this consistency issue? Was there a disastrous outing? Uh, was it uh, maybe a specific practice where they were overthrowing the, you know, overthrowing on pickoffs, overthrowing on team defenses? Was there some specific uh, kind of confidence related incident that occurred? Um, usually we can, doing a little bit of digging, identify what the underlying uh, specific instance is where these issues stem from. So from there, we can actually it can actually inform us from a coaching standpoint how to uh, better attack this command and consistency issue. So knowing the cause informs the prescription. Um, do we need to have a physical intervention? Uh, we know there's going to be some sort of mental component here, but is it going to be exclusively maybe a psychological intervention? Uh, in some cases, is it going to be a mechanical intervention? So we really need to understand the underlying cause before we establish what do we actually do about it. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, there was an injury protective mechanism at play. And this is a really common uh, cause, underlying cause of uh, somebody kind of getting in the Superdome. So maybe it starts off with a flexor strain. And so that slightly alters that pitcher's mechanics, right? Maybe they're a little bit limited in elbow extension. Their body's kind of guarding. They're having a little bit of pain. So they subtly and subconsciously change their mechanics a little bit. Maybe their ball starts cutting. Maybe now they're having issues with command. And again, everything becomes a mental issue at some point. So uh, maybe now they're having some confidence issues uh, after they've had a couple bad outings and really could have started from an injury protective mechanism. Well, so the issue here is we need to get their elbow healthy. We need to be able to, uh, again, establish like, is this an issue that requires uh, physical therapy, requires shutting down? Is this something where we can target it uh, more from a preventative maintenance standpoint in the weight room? Uh, what exactly is going on there? And so we know that more likely than not, if we can address that protective mechanism, we're going to be able to address everything else. But then again, it may be undoing a bad cue. Uh, it may be this example of uh, you know, a pitcher with a certain type of arm action uh, was completely changed by a pitching coach, or maybe it was a subtle cue that was, was given that just uh, kind of slowly and in, in insidiously uh, altered their efficiency, altered their command, and again, began to lead to, to some confidence issues. And it could have been a disastrous outing, could have been a specific uh, incident that really just shattered their confidence. Uh, I can imagine, uh, I can remember some different instances in like team defenses in college uh, where a couple pitchers were just like overthrowing, uh, overthrowing the base uh, or like pickoff, uh, pickoff attempts where maybe have a bad pickoff to second base on 
uh, kind of team practice drills and all of a sudden you have this confidence issue associated with, with doing a pickoff to second base. So sometimes you can distill it to like a specific disastrous outing or incident and that's going to have a different, uh, different prescription as well where you might need to, again, regain out of context, out of pressure, uh, that confidence in that specific situation, whether it's a pick off to second base, pick off to first base, um, or it's you know being able to kind of throw strikes in high pressure situations. The solution here a lot of times is being able to remove pressure, remove variables, uh, and see if they can hold that pattern in a very simple context before we add in more complexity. So regaining confidence, regaining some level of success maybe just to a catcher, but no coaches there, just fastballs down the middle. Hey, maybe now we add back in the standard hitter. Now we add in uh, kind of game situations. Um, regaining confidence is important, uh, in kind of out of context before we add in the complexity, add in the pressure, uh, when it kind of stems from more of a, a specific disaster scenario. Uh, tip number two is to stop changing variables. So once you kind of recognize that you're in this state, you recognize, right, you're in the Superdome, um, there's a common tendency to constantly just be grasping at straws, wanting to change things all the time. So it's important to recognize that like this basically creates this really negative feedback loop that feeds into itself and just gets you further and further down this, this kind of rabbit hole. So loss of consistency can lead to this loss of confidence. That loss of confidence leads to even more loss of consistency a lack of, of positive performance, and it just kind of feeds into each other, creating this downward spiral. So to get out of it, we need to be calculated in our approach. We need to understand the, the underlying cause, or at least what we think it could be, and establish a plan, and then actually give that plan uh, of an honest effort and give it a specific timeline to follow that plan and see if there's actually a, a net positive net benefit there. So we've all seen the guy who's constantly searching. Um, my story, so, I've been there again in high school, but then at certain periods, kind of early in college, where I would have considered myself in, in this like Superdome state. Uh, there were times when I would spend hours doing dry reps, like every single uh, night after practice in the locker room, just totally out of context. Like one day I would be trying to mimic so-and-so MLB pitcher's mechanics. The next day it'd be a different pitcher's mechanics. The next day I'd be trying something different, uh, filming every rep, just trying to, just constantly chasing something different. Um, and the reality is that that didn't work very well for me at all um, because I was just changing too many variables at once versus actually uh, sticking with one thing for a set period of time. So if you're gonna do this, come up with a plan, stick to it for a set time frame. Say, hey, I'm gonna uh, attack this, whatever, whatever you establish the, the underlying cause to be, I'm gonna attack it with this drill or this intervention or this cue, and I'm gonna do this for a week and a half, I'm gonna do this for two weeks, and here's how I'm going to evaluate if it's working or not. If you do that, you're actually gonna give yourself a much more uh, consistent and uh, prob uh, higher probability of actually having a positive outcome from that. So number two, stop changing so many variables constantly. Uh, tip number three is to simplify the approach. Again, this kind of feeds into not changing too many variables. Um, we talked about this more in another video, so I'll link that, but just to, to summarize, um, when you're struggling, when you're searching, especially if you're kind of off the mound, you're in competition mode, um, it's better to have the catcher just set up middle and switch that mindset from kind of defensive to offensive or aggressive and give yourself a lot more room to work with. So the cue that I really like here that I covered in the other video is blow up the center of the catcher. I know it seems like a overly simplistic thing that couldn't possibly work this well, but it really does work and we've, we've seen it uh, work time and time again. And the reason is that we're now giving ourselves more room for error. If the catcher's setting up middle and we take this aggressive approach, let's say we're missing by 12 inches. Let's say we're missing by a foot and a half even from where we're trying to throw the ball. Well, at least if you're setting up middle and you're missing by a foot, you're ending up close to a corner. You're ending up on a corner somewhere. If you're constantly trying to nibble uh, this nibble corners, nibble the very top edge of the zone, the very bottom part of the zone, and you're missing by a foot, well, now you're way inside, way off the plate, way up out of the zone. So you're just giving yourself more room for error. The other thing to realize, and a lot of coaches don't realize, is that when a pitcher's in this state, like you can pretty much toss all the scouting reports, you can toss reading the hitter, um, you can toss pitch sequencing, like you can toss all that stuff out of the window if you're in this mental state, because it's such a, such a loss of consistency and confidence that we just need to regain that uh, by any means necessary. So if you have to throw the ball down the middle as hard as you can until you can regain that confidence and your ability to even get the ball in the vicinity of the strike zone, 
Um, to me, that's kind of the, the first step. Again, if you start throwing too many strikes, um, if you really are actually just ending up middle, middle, every single fastball is actually ending up middle and you are uh, starting to have hitters do a ton of damage on that, great, now you can split the plate into halves. Now your command is starting to come back. That's a good problem to have if you start actually ending up middle, middle with all these fastballs because now your command is starting to come back. Your confidence should be starting to come back because you're actually able to get the ball in the zone consistently, split the plate in halves, and then again, continue from there. Uh, another kind of point I wanted to include in this tip is soft versus fine focus. So trying to be super fine, trying to hit these pinpoint spots, um, not the easiest way to kind of rebuild confidence because you're not going to hit that pinpoint spot very often. Uh, the average big league pitcher is missing their spot by, uh, I believe it's almost a foot. So you're not going to be exactly hitting this pinpoint location unless you're Greg Maddox. So if you're constantly evaluating the success or failure of a pitch based on if you hit your, if you accomplish that goal, if you make the goal something where you're almost never going to accomplish hitting that spot where it's that fine of a target, then you're constantly gonna be reinforcing this like failure mentality where every pitch is some sort of failure. If you open the zone up and you say, I just wanna blow the ball down the middle and you end up throwing a strike and you have a positive outcome to that pitch, then that's just reinforcing this, uh, this positive uh, mental groove that you're trying to get back into. So that's more of a soft focus where you're seeing the entirety of the catcher's body, the entirety of the strike zone, and you're giving yourself this, this wider uh, zone to work with versus this very small zone. And then one tip that can help with uh, getting out of this fine focus mentality, again, it doesn't work for everybody, but if soft focus uh, is beneficial for you, which it is for a lot of pitchers, um, looking down or looking away at some point in the windup, some point in the delivery, picking up the target a little bit later, can actually help kind of break that uh, conscious thinking portion of the, the delivery and get you into more of this like automatic robotic, um, you know, autonomous mentality. So whether that's in your windup, you look down briefly and then pick up the target as you lift your leg, whether it's during your leg lift, you look down briefly and then pick up the target uh, coming out of your initial leg lift. There's a lot of successful big leaguers, a lot of Hall of Fame pitchers who have done that. So don't let any coach tell you that looking down, looking away uh, can't be a, a successful way of repeating your mechanics and having consistency. So tip number three and a half, this kind of links to the other point is offense versus defense. Um, there's a huge difference between trying to avoid failure as your main objective and trying to achieve success. So are you just going out there throwing a bullpen uh, in uh, throwing an inner squad, pitching in a game? Are you trying not to lose? Are you trying not to walk the batter? Are you trying not to leave a pitch out over the plate um, because you're scared that the batter is going to hit it? Or are you actively going out there with this mentality of I'm trying to dominate? I'm trying to blow this pitch by you. I'm just trying to throw a nasty hammer uh, to get the, the swing uh, strike out. There's a huge difference. Like imagine if you imagine if you go to work every day and your goal was just not to get fired. Your goal was to just not do anything, to step on anybody's toes. You don't want to piss anybody off. You're just trying not, you're just trying to escape by, not get fired. Versus your goal going in, I'm going to dominate. I'm going to do my absolute best work and show what I can do. It's a completely different mentality, and this applies obviously to pitching, but to any aspect in life. Um, but especially when it comes to like, am I specifically just trying not to let this batter do damage, or am I trying to dominate him? Uh, this links back to, we've all heard it, don't just throw it to the target, throw it through the target. Um, but again, just we constantly need that, that reminder. A lot of guys, especially in the Superdome uh, scenario of trying to do damage, having this offensive, aggressive mindset. And then for any coaches watching this, like what are you incentivizing uh, in your practice plans? What are you incentivizing in how you uh, coach your athletes? Uh, I'll link a thread that I did on Twitter uh, kind of discussing this, but are we trying to negatively reinforce things like are are we having our uh, pitchers throw bullpens and we're punishing them if they have a wild pitch or after an outing we're making them run sprints if for every walk they uh, every walk they surrendered uh, in their outing they have to run a sprint like are we punishing failure because that creates this negative feedback loop where we're just afraid to fail or are we reinforcing successes and so I would encourage coaches uh, looking through this like is there a way that we can put positive reinforcement for when a guy does go out there and uh, show that he's trying to dominate hitters, he's trying to be aggressive, and we can reward that versus trying to actively go and punish when they make a mistake and turning them to uh, where they're kind of fearful and always on tiptoes, walking on eggshells, and trying not to uh, not to walk a batter, not to surrender run, not to do all these other things. 
Tip number four, uh, I think this is a really important one, is to eliminate any excess voices. So you get in this super dome mindset, other people can start to see. Other people can start to see you're searching, they can start to see you're struggling, and everyone has a voice, everyone wants to help, and people start giving feedback. Problem is that everyone's giving uh, different feedback. Everyone has a different idea of what you need to do to, to flip the switch. So uh, for me, um, I can think back just to, to one spring training. I wasn't particularly struggling at this time, but uh, I did have eight different coaches in about a two hour period that talked to me and they all had different ideas of what I needed to do differently. And so you could think of just how much more uh, impactful this would be for an athlete that's really struggling with consistency to have everyone trying to come at them with different things that they need to do differently. And so this again goes back to changing too many things at once. Uh, even if there were eight positive ideas, eight well-intentioned ideas uh, out of these eight different coaches, there's no way in hell that I could actually incorporate all eight of them in any real uh, consistent manner. So ultimately I would recommend having one to two trusted sources and then still having your own uh, BS meter. You need to be able to filter out the advice, filter it through your own BS meter and decide, okay, what is the actual plan that I'm going to uh, enact? What am I actually gonna go ahead and do? The player needs to be bought in and understand that change and then the coach and the athlete together from that point on uh, need to be on the same page moving forward. So if the coach makes a suggestion and you're not fully on board as an athlete, that's okay. You can only focus on one, two, three things at a time. So um, really need to be on board. And even if the advice seems good, um, we need to identify what are the priorities here and pick your one or two or three things to actually be focusing on. And again, giving it a set time frame to actually work on that change. Uh, number five, one gear. So I really haven't seen a lot of uh, people of any talk about this component, but something that I found gave me more consistency in my own career was not trying to pitch with multiple different gears. So what I mean by that is up and down reg regulating your intensity during an outing is extremely difficult to do for some athletes. Some, some pitchers have natu naturally just have this incredible feel where they can do it. They can throw a batting practice fastball Oh, oh, get me over fastball, and then they can ramp it up with two strikes and blow by the guy. Um, but it's, it's a very difficult skill for some pitchers to get. It's a lot simpler to just say, when you go out there, I want you to throw everything out of one gear. Everything, throw everything max effort, one gear. Uh, it doesn't have to be like falling on your face max effort, but have one consistent gear. Don't try to have one, one fastball, oh, oh, a different fastball, oh, two, a different fastball, uh, 3-0, uh, have one consistent intensity, and this is actually gonna simplify things drastically if that's something that you particularly are struggling with. So one gear uh, removes intensity as a variable that you have to control. There's all sorts of variables uh, kind of floating around. If we can just take that one off the table and say your intensity is going to be game intensity and you're not up and down regulating it. That's just another way to simplify the approach, another, another way to regain a little bit of confidence, a little bit of consistency. Number six, I've talked about before, which is establishing a pre-pitch routine. Um, this is much less talked about in the baseball world than in the basketball world. And so I like to mention it constantly because I think we need to change that. Um, here's Steve Nash explaining uh, how he first developed his free throw routine. Steve Nash, currently the all-time leader in free throw percentage. He's percentage points ahead of Mark Price. I think I was in the 10th grade and I had a coach that said you should do exactly the same thing every time you shoot the ball. So I decided then that I was going to dribble the ball three times, take a deep breath, and shoot the ball. So it's a routine that's been with me for, you know, over 20 years. So, uh, you know, I've stuck with it and uh, I feel comfortable in it. And, you know, when you practice something and you stick with a routine, you take away all the unknown variables and it allows you just to feel confident and focus in on the technique. So as you can see in the basketball realm, like they figured it out a long time ago that uh, having some sort of pre-shot routine is extremely beneficial when it comes to free throw per percentage. But yet in the baseball world, we still have barely uh, scratched the surface as far as figuring out routines and consistently implementing routines top down from the high school, uh, pro, college level. So my take on this is that if we're trying, if our, out if our goal uh, in pitching is to have more consistent outcomes, is to throw the ball where we want it uh, consistent consistently, well, we need relatively consistent mechanics 
which is going to require a consistent release point. Um, and that's going to ultimately require a more consistent mental state. So the more consistent our initial mental state can be, um, the better chance we have towards creating the consistent mechanical patterns and then the consistent, uh, consistent outcome. If our mind is just bouncing all over the place all the time and it's ebbing and flowing uh, with the game as you kind of go through the successes and failures of the game, it's gonna be much more difficult to consistently command the baseball, consistently command the zone. So one analogy that I'll use when I'm talking to an athlete about routines is this analogy of like a ship at sea. And that ship at sea, you can kind of represent that as your mind. Um, there's all sorts of waves going all over the place. Maybe there's a storm, maybe you have calmer days, but your mind is constantly like, you can have that ship constantly going, ebbing and flowing with, with the waves and with what the sea is doing and with the direction the sea is taking your mind. And so during a game, you can just let it pull you in all different directions, your mind's all over the place. If you have a pre-pitch routine, that functions as an anchor. So it functions as that's the thing that holds you in one steady place despite all sorts of variables changing in the game situation around you. Maybe you just gave up a 3-2 home run. Maybe you just gave up a leadoff double. Maybe you just struck out the last two hitters and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. It doesn't matter. If you have a pre-pitch routine, it gives you something that you can use as your reset, as your anchor, so that you're not ebbing and flowing with the game and you're able to consistently just flush the previous pitch, go back to this robotic mode and give yourself that consistent uh, mental state before every single pitch. Routines in my case were my saving grace, at least early in college when I was making so many mechanical changes, I was all over the place, um, but I had a pitching coach who really understood the value of routines and so that's something we would practice every day, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. And so that was something that I could use as my anchor to still go out there and compete despite my mechanics having changed the day before, or start you know, working on a new leg lift or working on a new pitch, uh, I could still rely on the routines. And so that was something that was extremely helpful for me and I saw the value in that despite all these other variables changing around me. You'll notice that the best pitchers tend to have the best routines. So there's a huge difference between the Cy Young caliber pitchers, the Corey Klubers, the Clayton Kershaws, uh, the Max Scherzers, and like your everyday average big league pitcher who just throws hard, um, but he doesn't really stick around for that long. These are the guys where you hear stories about them driving the exact same truck that from when they were initially drafted, you know, 10 years ago. Um, these are the guys who are religious about when they start their throwing before a start, about when they get to the ballpark. And there's a reason for that. They understand the importance of routines and they actually dedicate time throughout the week, throughout the season, to working on their routine. Gary, I asked Phil Regan today about working with Jacob deGrom on a daily basis here at the major league level. What stands out about the pitcher? And he said, well, first of all, he is so programmed in his routine. He will not make a throw on the field until exactly 645. He just keeps looking up at the clock, looking up at the clock. 644 turns to 645, and there he goes, starting his throwing program. Says he is incredibly precise with everything he does day of game, committed to it, and never deviates from it. We've all seen videos of Kluber throwing a bullpen, looking like a total robot, calling Klubot. We've all seen videos of Clayton Kershaw doing dry reps before a start. Um, this is why it's so, so important to have a pre-pitch routine. And not just a pre-pitch routine, which we're talking about now, but an intra-inning routine and a pre-game routine as well. So how do we build our own routine, right? We understand that routines are important. The first thing is to write it down in detail. So this seems stupid because you might just write down, well, get the ball, step on the rubber and pitch. And if that's the level of detail that you've got, then that's the point of this exercise is to actually break it down into a little more detail than that. Okay, where on the rubber do you step? Do you kind of paw the, paw the dirt with your cleats? Do you uh, move the dirt around? How many times? Um, how wide do you come set? When do you pick up the target? Do you take a breath? How many breaths? Do you think anything during those breaths? Um, do you have some sort of mental keyword that you say when you come set or just before you throw the pitch, like attack or quick or whatever that keyword for you that might be most beneficial. Uh, take some time to actually write down what your routine is and now that gives you something to practice. So now you can practice that routine. I would especially encourage you to practice it uh, pre-season and obviously in season. Five minutes per day. The simple way to think about this is you're doing dry reps. It's not like you have to do your, throw out of your delivery max intensity or anything like that. but just practicing how you come set, when you take the breath, delivering a pitch, 
and it's almost like you're throwing a simulated outing every single day from a mental standpoint. If you do a bad rep in your head, think, well, okay, that was a ball. So now it's a 1-0 count. I do it, did a good rep. I followed my routine properly. 1-1 one, one count. And you kind of go through a little sample, like three or four hitters in your head, spend five minutes, do 15, 20 reps through your delivery, just working on your routines every single day. Ideally, you do this off a dirt mound, like in the bullpen area, maybe while you're shagging, the rest of your team is shagging batting practice, maybe your coach will let you take five minutes a day just to work on some dry rep work. But really, I wouldn't think of this more as much mechanical work as mental reps to feel just more consistent in your routines. And it gives you something, again, to anchor to in the game, especially when things start to go wrong. Tip number seven, this really is not talked about nearly enough, is to stop watching your own video so much. Uh, especially important for the guys who are in this Superdome mentality. Again, I've been there. Um, this is really a difference between internal versus external focus. The guys who are always looking at their video, they're looking at how their mechanics look. Um, they're very like internally focused on the positions their body is in, they're focused on the patterns, and they stop, they stop being focused on actually executing pitches and on competing and on everything else outside their body. So we need to get you from this internal to this external mindset. Um, what this does, getting rid of constantly watching your own video, allows you to get better at actually feeling your own patterns uh, and feeling your mechanics versus always needing this, this validation aspect from video. So we should just be so in tune with our own body and with trying to execute pitches that you don't need to go constantly look at where your elbow was in space or where your shoulders were in space uh, to know if that pitch was a good pitch or not. So we can obviously become reliant on video feedback. This also can be further applied to being reliant on other forms of te technology, uh, being reliant on needing a radar gun constantly. So if you're a guy who throws every single day with a radar gun, I would advise you not to do that because if you overdo it, pitchers can become reliant on that feedback. Same thing with coaching feedback, the coach who gives uh, verbal feedback after every single pitch, those pitchers become reliant on it. They start looking back for the feedback as soon as they finish the pitch and they need that external validation, that external feedback uh, just to be able to execute the next pitch. So I would just caution you on overdoing the video, especially if you're beginning to lose this consistency. Uh, my story with this in high school, so I, I was a guy who thought I needed absolutely picture perfect mechanics to ever one day throw hard. And so I would film every single throw of all my training sessions. Um, I'd be going over to the video and checking if that throw looked good or if that throw looked good every three to five throws. Uh, not only is it impossible to actually get your work in and any sort of real flow uh, when you train that way, it just didn't work. I was so obsessed with the exact positions I was in that I had no feel for my delivery, no feel for uh, you know throwing strikes, no feel for actually just being an athlete. So it really made me less dynamic of an athlete trying to constantly focus on what I looked like. Uh, I got to college, obviously wasn't allowed to film myself in practice, like you're just not allowed to do that. Um, and despite that, I went from mid 80s to mid 90s over four years without radar feedback, without a ton of coaching feedback, to be honest, like verbal feedback constantly every day, not a ton of that. And with really no video feedback, there would be six month spans where I didn't even, never saw a clip of myself throwing whatsoever. And so what this did is I actually began to develop feel. So I'd really encourage you to get away from, if you're an athlete, get away from watching your own video. Um, hopefully you have a coach that you, you can trust, that you do trust, to be able to just kind of monitor your mechanics, monitor the video for you, um, and be able to alert you of anything, like any huge red flag comes up. But as much as you can, I would say, begin to uh, take watching your mechanics with a grain of salt. Uh, I think less is more in this case. And this finally ties back to uh, recognize that function is ultimately, at the end of the day, greater than form. There's obviously an importance of having some level of efficiency in your mechanics, but there is no such thing as one perfect set of mechanics. So if we're always just trying to chase hitting a certain exact position, um, I'm not sure that's as important as being able to say that a certain, if a certain pattern cue, focus, etc creates a positive result. So increased velocity, increased efficiency, increased command, uh, it feels uh, better on the athlete's arm. Like these are all positive, uh, positive outcomes that we're shooting for. And I care about those more at the end of the day than if they had a textbook 
you know, number of degrees of elbow flexion at landing. I don't care as much about that because I've trained and dealt with so many like high level, even MLB guys who don't have textbook perfect mechanics. So don't think that you necessarily have to move exactly like a Nolan Ryan or insert any MLB pitcher's name to throw hard. Don't think that form is the absolute top of the pyramid. Uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to, is what you're doing working? Is it efficient? Are you able to throw healthy? Are you able to throw strikes? Are you able to throw hard? Uh, to me, that's what matters at the end of the day. You don't need constant reassurance from video uh, to chase that. So my final tip, if you're in the Superdome, is to zoom out or find a way to trick yourself into caring less. So what do I mean by that? Um, so a lot of times these pitchers are hard workers, they care a ton, they just, they want to perform, uh, they've been working hard their whole life, they're, they're just trying to do a good job, and so they care a ton, but this can actually be kind of flipped around and kind of be their kryptonite at times. So I can remember thinking uh, myself, like, there's certain players who just don't seem to care, they just don't seem to work, a ton, work that hard off the field, but at the same time it also helps them in the game because they don't really, uh, they don't really seem to get as attached to the, the pressure of the situation, the implications of, of the situation that they're in. And so I would always be envious in certain, in certain uh, perspectives of these, these players who just didn't seem to care. They could just walk on the field, uh, you know, with some swagger, not really care, like shove for an inning, walk off, like not really do their arm care, not really seem like they, they work that hard. But at the same time, I was like, what if I could just capture that caring less when I'm actually on the field? Just go out there, attack, don't really care what happens, and move on. And so if you can find a way to remove that pressure from yourself and give yourself some perspective, like to actually free yourself up while you're out there competing, um, to me, that's kind of the ideal scenario. So maybe you tell yourself like, hey, this, this single outing, this bullpen, doesn't actually define your whole career. Like, so what if I go out there and give up a home run, so what? Like my career will go on. This is all a learning experience. This is all an opportunity to continue refining what I'm what I'm doing as as an athlete, refining myself as a pitcher. So what? It doesn't matter. Uh, I'll learn from it. Every pro pitcher has had disastrous outings and, and they survived. Um, it's important to think about. Like you look at any Hall of Fame pitcher's career, you you scroll through their outings. Like Clayton Kershaw's had terrible outings. Corey Kluber's had terrible outings. Max Scherzer's had terrible outings. Did they let that just completely crumble and ruin their careers? Or did they find a way to learn from it, bounce back? Of course, that's what they did. So recognizing that successful pitchers have also been there to some extent. Um, I believe this was the final interview that Kobe Bryant ever did, but he had a really insightful uh, thing that he would tell himself um, because he was, he was asked about um, what do you do to deal with the pressure? What do you do to deal with a bad game? Um, and he said, it's really important to realize, hey, it's not about you get over yourself. So he'd tell himself, get over yourself. If he started feeling sorry for himself, if he started feeling like he was stuck, if he started worrying about the pressure, like get over yourself. Um, and get, so he, so that simple little phrase he, he would tell himself, it would give him now this perspective, like, hey, it's not about you, it's about the team. Um, you don't have the luxury of feeling sorry for yourself. And so something as simple as that, get yourself out of that, that rut, get yourself out of that mindset and provide a little bit of perspective to what's going on. Get over yourself. Yeah, that's where you go. Get over yourself, right? Like you're worried about how people may perceive you and like you're walking around and it's embarrassing because you shot five air balls. Get over yourself. My kind of story that relates to this, this topic of caring less, um, I didn't play a ton my first few years of college. I just simply wasn't really good enough. I dealt with some injuries as well. Um, so I started getting innings as a senior and a lot of these innings were high leverage innings, runners in scoring position, no outs, one out, run on third base, like very, uh, very low room for error in these situations. Uh, initially, I kind of struggled because uh, I would build up the pressure in my mind. So I would tell myself, I have to be absolutely perfect to get out of this inning. I need to like strike out these next three guys in a row just to get out unscathed. And so that actually led to worse outcomes because that's what I was focusing on. I was focus focusing on how perfect I had to be. Whereas if I had a clean inning, I started the inning with, with nobody on base, uh, to me, that felt like just this pressure lifted off. I didn't have to be perfect. I could just go and attack the first guy, attack the second guy, attack the third guy. So I figured out how to trick my mind into treating these, these high leverage innings as a clean inning. So I would just go out there and pretend that the bases were clear. I'll pretend, oh, there's runners there. Like, yeah, I know there's runners there for the sake of covering bags or whatever. Um, 
but I'll tell myself that this was a clean inning. Tell myself those runners just were fake. They didn't exist. Like they were the previous pitchers runners. Like if I could just trick my mind that way, what I found is that that actually started to free me up uh, and kind of be able to pitch with, with that weight lifted off my shoulders versus not trying to be so perfect. I just went out there in attack mode, went out there free, easy, clear, um, and just consistently telling myself that like that was enough to, to flip that switch in my mind. So I'm not saying that that's exactly what you need to tell yourself. I'm not saying that what, what Kobe told himself is what you need to tell yourself, but finding a way to zoom out and gain perspective and care less can be very, very powerful. Thanks for watching this video. Uh, hopefully you got something out of the video. If you did, go ahead, comment down below what your favorite part of the video was. And if you're not already subscribed to this channel, go ahead and do that right now. Give this video a thumbs up. And if you don't already follow us on social media, give us a follow on Twitter at Tread Athletics, Instagram at Tread underscore athletics. And if you're struggling with anything in your own career, shoot us an email at contact at treadathletics.com and we will get back to you. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks again.